We do not provide investment advice. We are not advisors. So if you're considering making an investment in a self-directed IRA, your self-directed IRA custodian does not advise you. This is going to be part of the presentation actually that the SEC in their letter uh, emphasizes. So if you are considering doing an investment inside a self-directed IRA, we encourage you to make sure that you talk to any advisors, attorneys, CPAs, people like that in your life. Do your due diligence on the investment. Okay. So a little bit about the interest group. We have been in business since 1981. We currently hold somewhere between 21 and 22,000 accounts, and we hold uh, coming up on $3.5 billion of, of investor assets in the account. Uh, we focus on education. We have a continuing education program uh, class. It's a two-hour, two two-CE credit class for realtors uh, that's available in certain states. Uh, the majority of us, including myself, are certified IRA service professionals, and we have offices throughout the United States. So we're headquartered here in Oakland, California. We also have an office in Reno, Nevada, in Hackensack, New Jersey, in Nashville, Tennessee, and in, uh, in Santa Monica, California. And if you are uh, interested in if you have, like if you're part of a realtor association or investor group or anything like that, and you want to have interest come in and do a presentation and talk about self-directed IRAs and how you can invest in alternative assets, I encourage you to reach out to us because uh, me or one of my counterparts would likely be happy to do that. And then, of course, we have these monthly webinars as well. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, what exactly is a self-directed IRA for anybody who's new to this? What are the benefits, the various types of investments, and then the, some of the restrictions? And then we're going to get into the whole point of this, uh, this webinar was a, uh, a, a, a bullet, a, a notice that the Securities and Exchange Commission has on their website. And they've actually had it for a while, but they recently had an update that essentially talks about uh, the custodian's responsibility and your responsibility as investor when it comes to self-directed retirement accounts. And within that, they talk about you know, ways that fraudsters try and go out after self-directed retirement account holders and ways that you can protect yourself. Uh, then the SEC also provides some links and, and what you can do in the event that you are subject to fraud. So we're going to go over that. And then finally, uh, we'll get to the last part, which is typically the longest part of the process, which is Q&As. So speaking of Q&As, feel free to type it down into the chat box and I'll get to them all at the end. I'll run through them all at the end. So what exactly is a self-directed IRA? Uh, it's simply an account in which a, a retirement account, be it a traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, a SEP, a simple 401k. Uh, we also have a health savings account, a Coverdell educational savings account. All of those can be self-directed into whatever you want to invest in. So when you open an account with a custodian like Entrust, because you have your retirement account, traditional Roth, whatever it is, with Entrust, by definition, that means it's self-directed, which means that you make all your own investment decisions. We don't advise you. We don't, uh, we don't sell you investments. And you can invest in non-traditional assets. So the IRS allows you to invest in things besides just stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but the majority of people who have retirement accounts have it with brokerage firms, and the brokerage firms doesn't allow you to, they're not willing to hold anything other than stocks, bonds, mutual funds. So if you want to invest in things like real estate, precious metals, private placements, promissory notes, racehorses, whatever, then you need to have an account with a custodian like Entrust, or ideally you have your account with Entrust. And then if the IRS allows you to make the investment in that transaction, there are rules around prohibited transactions and disqualified persons that we'll get to. But assuming that the investment that you want to make doesn't violate uh, any of the internal revenue code uh, aspects of it, then we will process and hold the investment. There's no investment that we're not unwilling to hold other than what the IRS doesn't allow you to hold, doesn't legally allow you to hold. So through that, you can diversify yourself instead of just being limited to uh, various funds that are all tied into the stock market. You can hold things like real estate and precious metals, etc. Um, in order for it to qualify as a retirement account, it has to be held by and administered by a custodian. Um, we, the Entrust Group and Entrust Trust Company, are the custodian of the account. Uh, technically, is how we're structured. The Entrust Group is the administrator. The Entrust Trust Company is the custodian, but it's all under the same roof. Uh, and then, um, as a last bullet point, custodians and trustees have limited duties to investigate assets. Due diligence is the account holder's responsibility. Again, this is a big 
aspect of what we're presenting here and that the SEC emphasizes in their letter is you can't expect, if you make an investment in your retirement account, don't expect the self-directed IRA custodian, don't expect the end trust group to do any due diligence on that investment. We do not do it. What we do is we provide the administrative and custodial services to make sure that you're doing it in compliance with IRS regulations as best as we can. And a lot of that's going to be dependent upon the information that you provide to us and whether, whether we can uh, determine whether you're compliant or not. Uh, what are the benefits? You get to make your own investment decisions. If you understand real estate, if you're a realtor, uh, why are you investing in mutual funds whenever your, your expertise is in real estate? Uh, other, I mean, other than diversification, but at least gives you the option you can invest in something like real estate. Uh, so you do get to diversify your account into other asset types, and you get the tax benefit. So if you buy a rental property in, uh, personally and then decide you want to sell it, you're going to get a tax hit on it when you sell it unless you do a 1031 exchange. But within a retirement account, your IRA buys the property, your IRA sells the property, the whole transaction occurred inside a tax-sheltered vehicle, which is the IRA itself, so there's no tax consequences to it. The only tax consequences are when you take a withdrawal or distribution from your retirement account. So what are the types of investments allowed? I focus on the, bo the very bottom bullet point, almost anything. As long as it's for investment purposes, then you can make the investment inside the retirement account, except for a few things, and these are those. The only things you're not allowed to invest in are collectibles, life insurance, and S-corporations. So collectibles, uh, art, uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, coin collections. There is a difference between uh, investment-grade metals and, and collectibles, and it's based on the purity or fineness of the metal. So you can see down at the bottom, gold, silver, platinum, palladium, bullion of certain purity. So there are dealers who sell investment grade of all those things, and there are, there are collectibles, and you can hold the investment grade in an IRA, but not the collectibles. So as we mentioned, any work of art, so you're not allowed to hold art inside your IRA, but you could invest in an art gallery inside your IRA. Any alcoholic beverage, so you can't hold bottles of wine inside your retirement account, but you could invest in a winery. Uh, so one, you know, one's investment and the other is collectible. So the, um, the Securities and Exchange Commission in, in August of this year, they did not they didn't update. So this, this, this uh, letter that they have on their website has actually been there for a while, but they, they amended it or updated it. Uh, this investor alert to warn investors of the risks associated with self-directed IRAs. And uh, the next bullet point, investments in alternative assets may have unique risks that investors should consider. Those risks can include a lack of disclosure and liquidity as well as the risk of fraud. This is specifically from the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission letter, the bullet that they put on there. Um, so the ultimate point of this is that you as the investor are assuming that risk because you're the one who's required to do the due diligence. So here's exactly the letter. I, I mean, I, you know, I know that you're not exactly going to be able to read that, but I'm going to show you where the link is to it. But I wanted to show you what it looks like. And specifically, one part of it we wanted to highlight says, fraudsters may be more likely to exploit self-directed IRAs because custodians or trustees of these accounts, like Entrust, may offer only limited protections. Custodians and trustees typically have only limited duties to investigate the assets or the background of the promoter. Um, and really from a standpoint of they're probably being generous and saying limited. We have no responsibility to investigate the, the, uh, the promoter or the investment company that you're investing in because we're not, we don't, work with them. We're not selling their investments. We don't get a commission from them. I can't speak for everybody in our industry, but I'm speaking about Entrust. We earn no commissions. We get no, no uh, finder's fee. We get no recourse from any investment that you make. The, 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 the fee comes from the account holder. Now, if you, have a, if you have an investment company that offers to pay your fee to us, that's the agreement between you and the investment company, or if you have an investment if you have an advisor who offers to pay the fee, and they're selling you an asset or they're recommending an asset, that's between you and them. 
right? Ultimately, our, we, we expect our account holders to pay the fee. If, if the investment company or, or an advisor chooses to pay your fee, that's something that you agree to and it has nothing to do with interest, right? So we don't get any kind of special arrangement from anybody that you invest with. And, and so if somebody is referring you to Entrust, it's because they uh, understand what we do and they know that you're allowed to do it inside a retirement account, so they're referring you to us. But that's a decision they're, make, they're making to refer you to us. And we don't, we don't refer any of our clients, any of our account holders to any investment companies. And on the same token, uh, if somebody refers you to us, they didn't we're, we didn't work out a side deal or anything like that. All right, enough on this page. Let me get, um, get a little more through it. So here's some information that's specifically contained within that letter that I want to highlight um, or that we're going to highlight. So here's three ways that people typically, um, the, the fraudsters try to target self-directed IRAs. One is that they mis misrepresent information to convince the investors that the investments are protected against losses. If you get that, then it should raise, all these should be red flags. All right? These should, should raise things. So if they're telling you that, that is not accurate. Any investment that you hold can go down. Right? The stock market can go down. Real estate can go down. People can choose not to pay their notes back. A racehorse can break its leg. There are all kinds of ways that your investment could potentially lose its money. And it's up to you to understand and assume the risk. It's a risk. It's up to the individual account holders. Um, if you take an early withdrawal, um, so it, they, they have a way of explaining that where if people are taking an early withdrawal and then it encourages people to be a little more, I don't know, passive in terms of following up and making sure that, that that something is going to happen. So it allows for fraudsters to be able to continue to hold that fraud up for longer than you would necessarily maybe put up with. And then also, if they don't provide you information, I, I've used this as an example before, is that Bernie Madoff, um, when after it all came to light that, that you know, he was committing this massive fraud for years and years and years, and people occasionally would ask him, how is he generating the t returns that he's getting? Like they would ask for more details, and he would simply refuse to tell them. He would tell them that essentially that it was proprietary information, and he wouldn't give them the information. Any investment that you make, you should be able to do a, a tremendous level of due diligence to find out exactly what they're investing in. And you know, if it's a real estate fund, they ought to be able to tell you the exact real estate that you're investing in. And that if you want to visit, you should be able to go visit it. If it's a private company that you're investing in, you should know the address. And, like all that information should be available to you. So if you're looking to make an investment in alternative assets, make sure you do your due diligence. That's ultimately uh, the most important thing because, again, self-directed IRA custodians are not going to do that due diligence for you. You have to do it. So if somebody is referring you to Entrust, Entrust has not done any due diligence on that company. It's up to you to do that. Uh, how can you avoid fraud? Uh, First of all, just check your, your statements. Like you have online access to your Entrust account to go in and review any statements. So make sure that the information is, is uh, accurate. Um, if you get, again, unsolicited investment offers, it's probably good to avoid those. Make sure you ask a lot of questions. Make sure that you understand what you're investing in. That what the, ultimately, if you're investing in some fund, understand what that fund is ulti ultimately investing in. If anybody is offering guaranteed returns, you want to you want to be you want to be careful with that. Uh, promissory notes oftentimes will have you know a, a certain percentage, um, which I mean you can look at that from a standpoint that it's a guaranteed return. Of course, that's assuming that the note gets paid back. Uh, but if you're looking to invest in some kind of fund or a private company and they're guaranteeing a certain return, I would be very careful with that. And then lastly. As we mentioned at the very beginning, talk to a CPA, talk to a financial advisor, have people in your life uh, that you trust and, and run any investment idea by them uh, that you, know, you believe that their judgment is sound uh, before you make any investment decision. So consult a professional, but even consult 
just people in your life, friends, family, uh, that you, you trust and, and think are smart. So here's some, uh, here's some sites in which the uh, SEC um, provided for you in case you are the victim of a fraud. And bear in mind, we, will send these, we send these slides out to everybody who attends these. So if you're you know, frantically writing this down or anything like that, you don't have to do that because you are going to get copies of these slides. But here's some various sites that you can reach out to in the event that you are the subject to a fraud or your IRA is subject to a fraud. And so the process um, is really easy. You open an account, which takes, if you do it online through our portal, takes about 10 minutes. You can fund your account, which is done by either making a contribution, uh, uh, annual contribution, but you have to make sure you're under the, your contribution limits to make that contribution limit or contribution, uh, a transfer from an existing IRA, or a rollover from a 401k, and then and that usually takes about five to seven business days. For, for that to happen. And then lastly, you purchase your investment, uh, which depending upon the asset, it typically takes us one to three days to process any investment that you want to make. So you submit the investment documents to us in the name of the IRA as the investor, the untrust group, FBO, your name and account number, uh, and then we will process the transaction. Okay, that was fairly quick. Um, here's the time, here's for the, we're going to get to the questions now. So go ahead and type those in, down into the chat box there, and I'll continue to go along with those, go along and answer them all. Okay, um, first question, are we live? Yes, we are live. Oh wait, I'm sorry, let me switch boxes here. Okay. When we, okay, so we have a whole bunch, I, as many of you may have known, um, may know that uh, a month or so ago, uh, Entrust was the victim of a uh, of a, a phishing virus. Somebody had had of, of a virus attack of a phishing virus that had gotten infiltrated our system. Uh, we don't know exactly how, um, and so we had some issues. Our our email we had to basically clean out our whole entire um, system, shut things down. We didn't have email access for a day or two. Um, we were just sort of we were paralyzed for a day or two before we slowly got everything back up. So there's a whole bunch of questions here that are based around that. And I'm going to read all these questions, one right after the other, and then I'm going to talk about it. So first question, when receiving a written request for distribution, well, maybe this one doesn't have to do with it, but the follow-up follow ones do. When receiving a written request for distribution from an IRA account, how, how does Entrust verify that it is a legitimate request and not someone impersonating the account holder. Uh, so first of all, and then the next question says, uh, I assume one cannot call in a request for distribution from an IRA account. It has to be in writing. Is that correct? So there's two ways that someone can request a distribution. They can fill out a distribution request form, sign it and send it back to us, or they can log into their account and they can make the request by logging into the account. The logging into the account process has a, has a verification authorization process. So if anybody's established an account with us, you know that you had to provide an email and, or, or provide a, uh, a phone number and get a text and then, uh, log, um, and then log in. And then it also recognizes like each time you log in your IP address. So if you tried from a different location, it's going to request a, you know, to go through a process again. Uh, otherwise, yes, it has to be a written request. And we verify your signature. So, um, so any request that comes in, we verify the signature, and then we dis send the distribution. We also, if there is a distribution request of a significant dollar amount, and I don't know the exact dollar amount. We have a cash management group that will, if a distribution request comes in, will reach out to me or my associate Jacob and will say, hey, we got this distribution request for this dollar amount. Please call the client make sure that they requested this. So one, there's a, a signature verification process, and then depending upon the dollar amount, there is oftentimes a follow-up phone call that's made to the client to make sure that they did make that request. Okay, so continuing the same person uh, asking questions. Entrust recently had their database hacked. Does Entrust ha not have a foolproof safeguard for future break-in? 
Uh, next question, is interest insured if someone had their assets stolen from the IRA account? If so, how much is one's assets insured? Is there a limit? Uh, as a result of the recent hacking of their database, does Entrust provide identity theft protection? And then on the recent break into Entrust database, what data was stolen should I be concerned? So we do have what's called errors and omissions insurance, e and insurance, uh, and that includes a cyber security aspect to it. It's a couple mil million dollar policy. I don't, our CFO would have to provide like specifics around that, but we do, and so I don't know the specific details. But we do have a, a, like a multi-million dollar, E&O stands for errors and emissions policy, that in the event that we make a mistake, and it has a, a cybersecurity aspect to it, that if anything happens with that, then it is insured. So you know, we pay for that. It covers everything. So um, is there a limit? I mean, I, 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 it's, a, it's a couple million dollars, but that's a per account type thing. So I, I don't know exactly. I think, it's, I think it's $2 million. It might be $3 million. So if somebody stole $4 million from an individual account, um, I'm not sure our, our, our insurance covers that aspect of it. But I mean, then Entrust would be liable for it. So um, the, the insurance covers Entrust. Like if, if we make a mistake and somebody loses their money, Entrust is going to Entrust is going to cover that. Sorry about that. Hold on. Entrust is going to cover that, um, and then we would put it through to our insurance, and then the insurance would reimburse us. So there's no limit. If we if we make an error and something happens, then it's going to get covered. Um, then do we provide identity theft protection? I'm not sure what you mean by provide identity theft protection. Our and, and I'll get to your last question. Does it, it, what data was stolen, should I be concerned? They didn't access any client data. What they did get were some email addresses, and not even all of them. So you know, we had some account holders that got these emails that were clearly, uh, that looked like they were from Entrust, but if you look at the actual email address and you look how the signature was, it's clearly not from Entrust. And I get, I mean, I, I haven't gotten any in a while, so they've kind of died off, but I was getting them coming to my, you know, my Entrust email address that uh, one of them looked like it was coming from the Hugh Broma, the owner of our company. And then they would, they would like ask us to buy, um, to, to purchase um, um, gift cards. <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean to laugh, but it was funny. Like this, like Hugh Bromo, my the owner of the company, saying, "Hey, can you go buy some gift cards for me?" Like that it was just absurd. But the fact remains that the only thing they got were some email ad addresses. They didn't access any of the client data. Um, they didn't access any any specific account data. So uh, I have Entrust accounts, and I'm not concerned. So should I be concerned? I wouldn't be. Um, we have, I mean, we have very strong controls. As far as what additional protections that we've put into place since then, I, I don't have the details on it. Our, our IT people sent out some emails as far as like the steps that are being taken, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't, I don't have all that like in the like still in my head as far as exactly what's done. But we have very strong protections in order to have like our online our online portal and all the things that we do. And we, are, we get audited, right? Like we have, we have internal audits and we also have external audits that come in and audit our processes and our transactions. And we've been doing this for 37 years and, and we, um, we have very strong controls and strong processes in place. And as a matter of fact, from a standpoint of any existing clients that are out there, any transaction that you want to do, the strongest protection you have is do it directly in our portal. Log into your account and do it through the portal. Because a lot of times people who are, are emailing us our forms are sending them from a uh, Hotmail and Yahoo and Gmail and we're responding. Like if they want us to send us something and they, we're sending it to a Gmail or a Hotmail, you have more risk there than you do directly going into our online portal and doing transactions in the portal. That's the strongest protection you can have. Um, so I, I think I, that answered all the questions. Um, and just from a standpoint of, of like hacking, I mean, Facebook has gotten hacked. Like, companies get hacked. Like, they're, those people who are doing that are pretty clever. And you know, it came through some kind of phishing virus that probably came through like somebody's email that they you know looked like something internal, and it got opened and it got into our system. And it can be as simple as that. And so we've 
we've gotten, you know, since then have had, you know, a number of emails going out reminding don't open email, you know, don't open these files unless you're absolutely sure who it's coming from, particularly if it's a uh, if it's a doc doc file, and I'll make that same comment to you guys. If you get an email from anybody from Mentrust and it's a it's a Word doc, it's not from us. We send stuff in PDFs because PDFs are hardly. I don't. I think they're much more difficult. I'm not an IT guy, but my understanding is they're much much more difficult to attach uh, any kind of virus to it. But they can get attached to Word docs and spreadsheets and things like that. So you'll notice when we send stuff out, we send out PDFs. So avoid Word docs. All right. I hope that 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 assures everybody, and particularly the person who answered all those questions. And um, my uh, contact information is right there. So you know, feel free to email and call me uh, if you want to discuss further. So all right, I'm going to move on. I have seven rental properties in my self-directed IRA LLC that I have with Entrust. Uh, thank you for your business, Mike. I'm trying to get $1 million umbrella insurance on these rental properties for asset protection. And the insurance companies I've dealt with so far will not in issue a policy because the rentals are in an LLC. Do you know any insurance companies that will write an umbrella policy for LLC owned rental properties? Uh, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't have any special knowledge of any insurance companies that will do that. Um, I encourage you to talk to an insurance broker. Um, I mean, I have I have a couple rental properties in my IRA, and you know I have a I haven't you know I got those insured, and so I would expect that like if a company is willing to insure um, a property held in an IRA, uh, I would think they would offer an umbrella policy. So if you have if you have each property insured under the LLC, I'm kind of surprised honestly that they don't offer an umbrella policy. But I'm sorry, Mike, I, I don't I don't have any additional information to provide you. Uh, does Entrust have a problem with me changing the self-directed IRA LLC that I've set up with you already to a series LLC so that I can have each of the seven rental properties in an LLC by themselves instead of all seven in one LLC? No, we don't have any problem with that at all. Um, it's going to involve some, some paperwork uh, on your part to re-register and, and change the ownership, change the type, excuse me, the title uh, on each of those properties from your current LLC to your new LLCs, and you obviously have to establish six more LLCs and, 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 trust, and, and instruct Entrust to uh, fund those, which you're going to be funding them by moving a property in. So there's going to be some paperwork associated with it, but no, we certainly don't have any problem if, that's, if, if you want to do that. Okay, next question. Am I correct in saying there is no early withdrawal from the Roth IRA? Um, no, you are not correct in saying that. Um, uh, if if you in a Roth IRA, the earnings in a Roth IRA go grow tax free as long as you have an account for at least five years five years and are are have reached the age of 59 and a half. So if you take a withdrawal from your Roth IRA, if you take a withdrawal of the earnings prior to age 59 and a half, then that's an early withdrawal, and you're going to be subject to tax and a penalty. Right now, can you withdraw the the contribution to a Roth? Sure because you didn't get taxed on the contribution, but it's the earnings that you'll get, you'll, you'll get taxed on if it's prior to 59 and a half. Um, and he says, I have a Roth IRA with interest. Thank you. We, again, appreciate the business. Uh, not understanding the uh, exploitation bullet. Why take an early withdrawal if the IRA is investing in an, in an asset? Withdrawal for what? So sometimes people... Um, don't understand that what, what that's saying is that there are sometimes people who don't understand that or they have an investment advisor or not an investment advisor, they have a fraudster, somebody who's selling an asset that will tell them, you know, make this investment, you can take the withdrawal and then, and then make the investment and you'll earn the money back and it will more than pay for the early withdrawal parental if there is one, right? So within a self-directed IRA, you're not making a withdrawal. You're, 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 you're making an investment inside a retirement account. But for people who don't recognize that, and there are a significant number of people who might want to buy you know, an investment property or, or invest in a, in a private placement or something like that, that instead of rolling that money over or transferring it to a self-directed custodian, they withdraw the money from the account 
and then they make the investment. Maybe they think, maybe they're told that they're going to get the money back within 60 days and they'd be able to put the money back in because if you take a withdrawal, you have 60 days to roll it back in. And so, um, and, and I think that that's specifically probably the 60-day thing. People might exploit that by saying, you know, I'll get the money back to you within 30 days or some amount of time to, in, order to, uh, in order to put it in and avoid that early withdrawal penalty, um, and then they don't get the money back. So, but that's what it's talking about, people who, who take money with, as a withdrawal because they don't realize they can do it in a self-directed IRA. Um, where can an investor find out about good real estate investments? <laughs> I mean, you got to do research. Um, attend investor meetup groups and Google and do research and whatever it takes. I, I don't really have a good answer to that question. I mean, you just have to, it, it's your responsibility to do that research. And so, I don't, I don't, if you're asking me for like websites or anything like that, I mean, it depends upon what you're looking for. Are you looking for trustees? Are you looking for tax liens? you want to buy turnkey rental properties? I mean, Google turnkey rental properties. You'll find a lot of people who will sell and, and, and you can purchase in your IRA, like a, a rental property that already has a, a property manager in place, already has a tenant in place, it's already receiving rental income, and you just turn around and buy it in your IRA. Uh, a lot of those exist. There's... Uh, there's crowdfunding platforms. There's various websites that, that can, can help you find uh, investment properties, but you've got to do some work. You've got to do the, the, the legwork on your own. Um, next question. One common real estate fraud is using quitclaim deeds to transfer ownership. How does Entrust prevent this? Um, how does Entrust prevent this? I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I don't know that there is a way that we prevent that. Um, I mean, if you, if our, an account holder requests um, real estate frauds, I, I actually, I think you might have to expand a little bit on what you're asking me here as far as how they're using quick claim deeds to transfer ownership. I mean, in order for an IRA, I guess here's the answer to the question. In order for the IRA to obtain ownership in a property, the IRA has to buy that property, right? So you can't simply quit claim deed a, and your IRA has to, has to sell an investment. So you can't, you can quit claim deed if you want to take a, a property inside your IRA as a distribution, then you could quit claim deed it to yourself, right? And that becomes a distribution to you. But you can't quit claim deed a property from your IRA to like some third party. That third party has to purchase the IRA, has to purchase the property from your IRA. So money has to come into the IRA. And in order for your IRA to own real estate, the, the cash in your IRA has to buy real estate. So I guess to answer your question, I don't know if this answers your question, but your IRA can't obtain property through a quit claim deed, and it can't it can't move property out of that through a quit claim deed unless it's to the account holder, and the account holder is taking it as a distribution. And so, if that's part of the fraud, is that if a client asks us to quit claim deed to us, there to them their property, and that somehow is committing fraud, then I don't know that we do have a way to prevent that. I mean, if the if the if, this, if the sell direction or the distribution request comes in, as I described earlier, through the proper channels with the proper signature, but somehow someone has, has forged your signature or something like that, um, or is, 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 uh, has a power of attorney and, and they're ripping you off, like I, I, I don't know that anybody is necessarily going to be able to prevent that from happening to you. Uh, we have our controls in place in terms of requiring signatures or doing things through the portal, that type of stuff. We need the proper documentation to process any transact excuse me transaction, but if that proper documentation documentation comes in, then we're going to process the transaction. Okay, um, as returns come in from an investment, does the Entrust Group provide access to any platforms for reinvestment, mutual funds, money market funds of these funds? We do. We're not a broker dealer, uh, so we don't have our own platform, but we work with a group called Interactive Brokers. So if you want to invest in a, uh, 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 stocks, bonds, mutual funds, then you can do so through this, uh, this Interactive Brokers platform. Uh, you would submit an investment request to us. So again, we don't, we don't recommend or promote or sell you any funds. 
And we have a pass-through cost of that, so whatever, intra, whatever invest, um, interactive brokers charges, we pass that through. But you would submit an investment request to us, and then we would put it through on the inter interactive brokers platform. Also, I will point out, and this is kind of an answer to the question earlier, the guy said, where can I find investments? If you have an account with us, and you log into your account, if you go to your settings, you will see that we have, we've added a new thing called Entrust Connect where if you click that, yes, you want to have access to Entrust Connect, and it's going to come up with a, with a screen that points out that um, with Entrust Connect, we have a list of potential investment opportunities that other Entrust clients have invested in, and, and in, in most of them where a, a fairly significant number of Entrust clients have invested in these. And they're typically private, private funds, real estate funds, private placements, those types of things. We've got, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so on there. Um, but again, these are simply investment opportunities that other Entrust clients have invested in. We haven't done any due diligence. We don't have any um, particular agreement. They're not paying us any kind of, uh, any kind of you know, fee to be on this Entrust Connect. It's simply a value add that we're providing to you, the account holder, for if you do have money coming into the account, you want to put that somewhere, and you don't want to put it in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, then you can click on that and see some other investments that are other clients have made. But again, you have to opt in for that. So, um, so you go to your website, go to settings, your account settings, and you'll see a button there that you can click to opt in to Entrust Connect. You have to acknowledge the uh, disclosures that say that we haven't done any due diligence, that you are encouraged. And then what we do is we connect you to them. So it, it has their, like, their offering and then you can, um, you can click on it, and if you're interested, you click on I'm interested, and then your information will get sent to them, and then they'll reach out to you, and then you can discuss and get all the investment documents and do your due diligence and do all your research and make sure it's an investment that you want to make. Uh, okay, uh, does Entrust have, a finance, have financial advisors that could help navigate opportunities? We do not. Again, it, as mentioned at the very beginning, Entrust is, we are not advisors. We don't provide any any investment advice. Uh, next question, if I use my IRA money for a flip, I am only funding it, not doing, doing the flip in the property. Can I also fund some of the money using non-IRA money? Yeah, that's a good question. You can. It's called partnering your IRA. So in the, in the purchase of the, of the property, on the purchase contract, your IRA would be listed as an entity that's buying, and you would be listed as an individual that's buying and with percentages based on how much your IRA is giving, bringing in and how much you personally are giving. Right? So if you're doing a 50-50, then it lists the Entrust Group, FBO, which stands for benefit of the Entrust Group, FBO, your name and account number, as to an undivided interest, 50%, and then your name as to an undivided interest, 50%. And I'm just using 50-50 as an example. It could be any percentages that you want it to be. And then uh, any work that's being done, so if it's, if it's a fix, then you know, you're paying contractors, you're paying people to do the work. Your IRA would have to pay its 50% or whatever percent, and you personally would have to pay those expenses at 50%. And then when you flip it, the revenue would go back to your IRA at its percentage ownership. Again, in this example, 50%, and the rest would go to you at your percentage ownership at 50%. It's one way to do it. You could also do it through an LLC where you name your IRA and yourself as a as the members of the LLC based on percentage ownership, and then have the LLC purchase the property, the LLC pay the bills, and then the LLC receive the revenue, and then the LLC can fund the money back to your IRA and back to you personally. So, I mean, in short, the answer to the question is, can you partner your IRA with your own personal money? Yes, as long as it's on a new investment. Uh, as far as uh, uh, logistically how you do it, you can either do it directly from your IRA and you, or you can do it through an LLC. If you have more questions on that, there's my contact info. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I have a lot of information about that. Uh, as we should hold title as, uh, she writes FTB, but I think you mean an FBO, can I invest property as a silent partner in an LLC, but this LLC borrowed funds from a commercial bank for a construction loan with a recourse, with recourse, personal guarantee from the principal? Um, yes, you can. Um, bear in mind, if you're investing in a, uh, you know, an LLC and the LLC is using borrowed money, your IRA might be subject to unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt finance income tax. I, I, it's, it's put a slash between those, UBTI or UDFI. They're opposite sides of the same coin. So 
Um, Angela, bear that in mind that you might have an expense called, you know, UBIT. So, uh, but you can do, yes, you can do what you, uh, how you describe it. When will you have secure upload? We already do. If you're talking about through our portal, we already do. It's already a secure upload. Uh, which brokerage company, which brokerage company you cooperate with for investment of idle cash on the account and, and trust to invest in stocks, bonds, etc.? I mentioned that earlier. It's Interactive Brokers. Uh, in short, two million dollars per account. Um, it, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't know all the details of how our E and O insurance works. Like we have a, 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 a CFO who who is responsible for all that. So I don't know all the the details of it. But again. If, if someone's account loses money because Entrust made a mistake, Entrust is responsible to reimburse that account. The, our insurance covers Entrust, right? So we would, we would cover it. We'd put the money back in, and we would submit the claim to, to the insurance company to give the money back to Entrust. So from a standpoint of your concern about whether it's $2, two, $2 million per account or whatever, if you lost money in your account, you're covered by Entrust. You don't have to worry about our insurance. Our insurance covers us. Um, but we do have you know, insurance, um, a pretty significant. My guess is it's, it's per, I think it's per error. Like, I don't even think it's per account. I think it's per error. But again, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the, uh, the responsibility to know that within our company. Um, at what amount request distribution requires a follow-up and trust phone verification? I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Our cash management, um, our cash management. I think it. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to speculate um, what it is. Um, I mean, email me, Don. Don, email me and ask that question, and I'll follow. And anybody else who wants to know, uh, please feel free to email me. Or at the end of this thing, um, you have a, a like an opportunity to provide feedback. And you're welcome to type in any questions that you know, I didn't answer adequately or, or to your satisfaction. Type it in again, and I, if I didn't know the answer, I'll find out the answer, and I'll, I'll respond to you directly. Um, the original compromise of Entrust email occurred in fall 2016. No one seems to have submitted that earlier breach. Do you have any comments? Original compromise of Entrust email, I don't recall that. I don't know of that. I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't have any comments because I don't. I don't believe that's the case. I'm not sure what uh, compromise of email occurred in fall 2016. I mean, if something happened back there, it certainly wasn't as significant as this. Um, this one just happened a month or so ago. Um, can my self-directed IRA hold a mortgage of a P, of a property sold from my self-directed IRA? How about holding a mortgage of a private sale? Can your self-directed IRA hold a mortgage? Of a, so can your IRA lend money? Sure. So if you're saying, can your property sell an IRA and hold back the mortgage on that, and then the, but the, buyer, the buyer pays the mortgage and interest to your IRA? Absolutely. You can do that. And uh, holding a mortgage of a private sale, now that's going to be more complicated. It depends. Um, if, it's, if it's a property that you personally own that you're selling, or your, or your spouse, or your ancestors, your lineage descendants, anybody that's a disqualified person, the answer to that is no. But you know, if you have uh, if you have a friend that's buying a property and they need to borrow money, and they're you know they're they're buying a, a they're buying just a, a property that has nothing to do with you or any other disqualified person, then sure, your IRA can lend the money and hold the mortgage. Uh, how have real estate self-directed IRAs been hacked? I don't know that they have. Um, I mean, a self-directed IRA, uh, there is no such thing as a real estate IRA. I mean, an, it, it is from a marketing standpoint, but an IRA is simply, a, self, a real estate IRA is just simply an IRA that holds real estate. So, I mean, if however people commit fraud whenever they sell real estate, then it's probably happened in a self-directed IRA. Like, I mean, I've, I've certainly seen things where people sell prop, like claim to sell properties that they don't really own or they sell properties to multiple different people. I, I imagine that a, a self-directed self IRA could fall victim to that if, uh, if all the documents came in and, and you as the account holder were instructing us to send the money and had all the purchase contract, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's not, 
it's not hacking the account, but I mean it's a it's a it's a type of fraud. Um, are there any waivers for early withdrawal? There are. Um, there are things like uh, like first time home buyer and uh, and certain um, uh, certain um, health expenses, healthcare expenses. Yes, there are some waivers for early withdrawal. Uh, I.e., military vet that is 100% disabled. Yes, like there are things like that. There, I don't, I don't, I have to look them up. I don't remember them all off the top of my head. But the answer to the question, in short, is yes. There are waivers for early withdrawal fees. Um, Next question is, I am 74 and looking hard at inheritance issues. I understand my grandson can inherit the Roth IRA. Where can I find the rules covering such an inheritance? Well, you can name, your, your, you can name anybody you want as the beneficiary of the account. And whoever you name as the beneficiary, when you die, then that becomes their account. Um, so where can you find the rules governing such an inheritance? I, in, uh, Google would be my suggestion. Um, but again, you, you would... You would name you have to, you would name individuals as your as your beneficiary, right? And then whoever you name as the beneficiary, and when you die, they would receive your they would they would now be open a beneficiary account and they would hold the account and whatever assets are inside that. Um, each property, there's quite, please go through the exploitation example again more slowly and or give another example. I don't know that I have one. Um, honestly, I'd have to go back and read the uh, SEC thing again. Um, but again, I think the early withdrawal thing they're talking about, my only, the only thing that I, I can come up with is that they're saying that some people can, will make an early withdrawal from their retirement account in order to make an investment, and now they're subject to, it becomes fraud, and then they also are subject to taxes and penalties because they made an early withdrawal. Uh, I'd have to go back, honestly, and, and look through the SEC. But we, we gave a link, and, and we're going to send this out. We gave a link. Uh, please read. I encourage everybody here to, to go and read that SEC notice. Like ultimately, one of the, the big things with this was that we wanted people to be aware that the SEC put out a notice and that we want everybody to go read it. So please, please go do that, and, and hopefully that will answer all your questions from that standpoint. Um, next question, each property should be its own LLC was the question. I mean, you had, I think you had asked or somebody had asked is, would we have a problem with they have an LLC that holds multiple different properties, and would we have a problem if they made each property under its own LLC? So instead of the IRA holding one LLC with seven properties, the IRA would hold seven LLCs. And the answer to that is no, we don't have a problem with that. You can do that. You don't have to. And you say each property should be its own LLC. I don't, I'm not saying it should. That's an individual decision. It can be. If that's how you want to transact, then you can. Uh, next question, does Interactive Brokers offer any special discounts or other incentive over other brokers? Um, <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I don't think there are any. I mean, I don't know. Like, it's, it's a platform. Since we're not a broker dealer, we need to utilize somebody else's platform. So Interactive Brokers is who we are going with. I mean, we could have used, in theory, we could have used Schwab or, or E-Trade or Scott Trade or anybody like that, but Interactive Brokers is who we're utilizing. So do they offer any special discounts or other incentive over other brokers? I mean, the, ultimately, if you want to use, if you want to have your own brokerage account and you want to, you know, for trading purposes, then, do, you know, research them and find out which one works best for you. From our standpoint, if somebody wants to do, stocks, bond, mutual fund trading inside their N-Trust retirement account, Interactive Brokers is who we use. Uh, next question, why wouldn't N-Trust Connect be a, a source of fraud in itself? Again, in theory, like if, 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 could someone on N-Trust Connect be a fraudster? Yes. I mean, I, it, from a standpoint of somebody that we list on there, uh, if they're ultimately committing fraud, and we've had, I don't know, 30 different N-Trust account holders over like the last couple of years have made investments through them, and, and you know, we've seen no instance of fraud or anything like that, or, but we have them list on there. And it turns out, like Bernie Madoff 30 years later, that all of a sudden it turned out it was a giant Ponzi scheme. 
it's possible that that could happen, right? Which is why with Entrust Connect, we're simply promoting it as these are investments that other Entrust account holders have made. Do your own due diligence. Do your own research on these. Entrust has done no due diligence on these. These are, other, these are investments that other Entrust clients have requested that we process in their account, and we have processed those requests. And we over the years have gotten a number of requests from our account holders to ask us, uh, have asked us, can you provide us other investment opportunities? Can you like, let us know? Can you, can you hook us up with some other investment opportunities? And so what we have decided to do, and it's something where Entrust is not the only one in the industry that has done this, um, I, is that we are listing some of these as what we promote as a value add to, to you as the account holder, and essentially value adds to the, the investment opportunities themselves. Uh, to one of so to our best referral partners, but we have not done any due diligence on these. So it's still your responsibility to do research and do due, due diligence. We don't know if these aren't. We don't think they are. Only from a standpoint that we have had another a number of of customers, another of clients who have invested and seem to be satisfied with it. But that doesn't mean that they aren't. I mean, there were a lot of investors with Bernie Madoff that were satisfied. Um, but that was because he was, you know, he was running a Ponzi scheme. He was paying old investors with new investor money. And if any of these guys are doing that, we wouldn't know because we don't do that kind of level of due diligence. But we did meet what we felt like was a desire and a need for a lot of our customers, which was to provide them some other investment ideas, some other investment opportunities. So, you know, it's, it's I mean, people have to opt in to Entrust Connect. They have to acknowledge that this is not anything that Entrust has, has done any investment on. And all we're doing is we're connecting you to them. You can't buy your investment directly through Entrust Connect. It just simply connects you to them, and then you have to, get, you have to talk to them. They have to talk to you. And you have to, you have to connect. Like once you connect together, it's up to you to, to make the decision on whether or not you're going to want to do it. Uh, next question is the income from a Roth IRA in the Entrust account taxable? No, it is well. If you take the withdrawal prior to 59 and a half, or you haven't had an account for five years, then the earnings are going to be taxable. Um, but if as long as you're over 59 and a half and you've had a Roth for at least five years, it is a Roth IRA. I mean, I understand that it's self-directed, but it's a self-directed Roth, so it's subject to all the same Roth tax rules. Is that it grows tax-free, and there's in, and and you don't have to pay any income tax on any withdrawal. Uh, on the earnings once you reach that age. Okay, for a traditional IRA, must start RMD at 70 and a half. How does that work with real property investment? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, what, what he's asking, so if you don't know, is that for any account, any pre-tax account other than a Roth, once you reach age 70 and a half, the IRS requires you to take a required minimum distribution, right? If you don't have cash, so I'm interpreting this question to say, you don't have the cash to meet your required minimum distribution, and you hold, let's say, like you hold just property, you just to throw out figures, and, and let's get crazy with it. Let's say you have a million dollar traditional IRA, and that million dollars is all one property, and that's all you have is that individual property worth a million dollars, and there's no cash, and you reach edge of 70 and a half, and you're subject to RMD, and for a million dollars, that RMD is going to be roughly $35,000, or 3.5% of the value of the property, right? In order to, you can take an asset as a distribution. So if you want to do that, then you can request to Entrust that we distribute 3.5% or $35,000 worth of the property to you, and then you submit the, the documents to us for the quitclaim deed, or, or we distribute it to you. I'm sorry. We will distribute that asset to you, we, that 3.5%. We will report that to the IRS. We'll send the IRS and you a 1099-R, and then it's up to you to do the quit claim or whatever, how you're going to change ownership, that 3.5% of that property now is owned by your name, and 96.5% is owned by the Entrust Group FBO, your name and account number. So uh, in short, the answer to the question is you can take an asset or a percentage of an asset as a distribution in order to meet your RMD. Now you're still going to have, it's still going to be a taxable event, which means you have to have the cash in your savings account to pay the tax consequences, but you are allowed to take a, 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 an asset as a distribution. Um, okay, wait. 
I can make my self-directed IRA and LLC, then invest through that. Yes, you're not making your self-directed IRA and LLC. What you're doing is you're investing your IRA into an LLC, and then the, so the IRA becomes the owner of the LLC. It becomes the member slash owner, what's called a single member LLC. And so the asset held inside your retirement account is an LLC. And then the LLC becomes a pass-through entity that allows you to make investments that you want to make. It gives you checkbook control. If you ever hear the term checkbook control or checkbook IRA, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about doing a single member LLC inside your IRA. By the way, not all self-directed IRA custodians are willing to hold single member LLCs. Now, Entrust is because, again, the IRS allows it, but I know at least one significant competitor of ours who, are, who simply are not willing to do that. Um, only a few questions left. Uh, inside your IRA, I cannot claim deductions. So what about expenses like travel, stationary, attorney fees, accounting fees, meals and entertainment, depreciation, or a loss? What about loss claimed by a developer that beyond my control is a silent limited partner of LLC and I have very small ownership with self-direct IRA funds? Okay, so you can't claim deductions because you don't own the investment. It's your retirement account that owns the investment. So that's the reason why you can't – first of all, you can't get reimbursed for things like travel, attorney – like attorney fees, yeah, the IRA would pay the attorney fees. Accounting fees, if, if, if the IRA potentially would pay accounting fees. Meals and entertainment, no. That's a personal expense. Depreciation, no. That's a, that's, that's a, depreciation is written off when, uh, on your personal income tax when you, have, when you get income from a property. But you're not getting the income from the property. The retirement account is getting the income from the property. So your retirement account is, re is responsible for any direct expenses for the property itself. So maintenance, property taxes, insurance. I mean, attorney fees, uh, accounting fees, probably not. Um, but depending upon how you structure it, I mean, if you do it through an LLC, then the LLC might occur those fees, then maybe you, they, they would cover those fees. But your personal attorney fees or your personal accounting, accountant fees, no. And, again, and certainly not travel and certainly not, you know, depreciation. Again, because, and please understand, you're not claiming any of this income on your personal income. It's all going into the retirement account. Either you're growing your retirement account or you're not but you don't get to write off expenses on your personal income taxes for an investment held inside the retirement account. You have to own the property on your, under your personal name in order for you to claim any of those expenses on your income tax. I hope that makes sense. Um, real life scenario, a contractor moved my funds from a designated project to another. What is he culpable for, wire fraud? I don't know, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I, you, you're going to need to talk to a lawyer or somebody to get that question answered. I don't have that expertise. Um, be, before, I got a few more questions, but I do want to mention that um, we had a uh, some promotion thing where um, we had a like a giveaway winner to anybody who attended this webinar. We were giving away a uh, a, a book from our owner Hugh and, and a, a duffel bag and a water bottle and some other stuff. And so the winner of that, by the way, is Woodley Rogers. So Woodley, you're going to um, I don't know. Jail, if there's anything particular he has to do, let me know. But I, I, my guess is we're probably just going to send you all that stuff in the mail. Um, speaking of Woodley, can we assign a beneficiary to the SDIRA without being an LLC? Oh, yeah, for sure. Again, the LLC is just an asset held inside the account. When you open your, your retirement account, when you open the account, you'll, you should name a beneficiary. You're not required to, but you absolutely should name a beneficiary. It, it prevents your retirement account from going into probate in the event that you're becoming part of probate in the event that you die. And, and if you name a beneficiary, then it, it doesn't go to probate. It goes directly to the beneficiary. But they're sort of two different things. There's the, the IRA itself where you name the beneficiary, and then once you have the IRA, you instruct us to invest in whatever you want to invest in. Your IRA purchases an asset. If you want the IRA to purchase an LLC, that becomes an asset held inside the account. Um, I'm sorry, can you describe how to find the Entrust Connect tab on the site? Yeah, so when you log into, it's not on our website. You have to, you have to be an account holder. You have to have an Entrust account and then log into your account, and then go to Settings, and then um, click the, click the on, Entrust Connect, turn it on. Um, so again, it's not on our website. It's only for our account holders. Um, 
So next question, if there is a property and cash in the entrust account, calcu in the entrust account how is the RMD calculated? RMD cal is calculated based on the fair market value of all of your retirement accounts. So if you have an account with Entrust and an account with, with Charles Schwab, and you hold $500,000 in each account, your RMD is based on a million dollars. And then your RMD is, has to, can be taken from any, either account or both accounts. So it can be taken from one, it can be taken from both. It doesn't have to be from any one account. But RMD is calculated based on the fair market value of your retirement account. So if you have one account with Entrust and you hold property plus cash, then the fair market value of the property plus the cash is going to be added together with a total. I mean, you log into your account and look at your statement. That's the fair market value of the account because we're going to have a value assigned to that property. Uh, and the last question, uh, Roth IRA, minimum five-year hold period. If I have an account for greater than five years, but today I was to put in more funds into an existing Roth, can I withdraw these new funds at any time even though it has not been in the Roth account for five years? Yes. You can withdraw a contribution to a Roth IRA anytime you want, and that, that contribution is not subject to tax because you didn't, you didn't get a tax deduction when you made the contribution. So any withdrawals of contributions, you can do it anytime with no consequences. It's earnings on the tax or earnings on the uh, investment that, that you have to wait until you've had an account for five years and over 59 and a half to, to make the withdrawal and have it be tax-free. Okay, that was, uh, that was it. Again, we're going to send you the, uh, the link. Um, please, please go um, to, the, to the SEC website and read the, uh, read the bulletin that they put out on self-directed IRAs and what the rules are that custodians have. Uh, that was the point. Uh, I did just get one more quick question. If I have a property manager for IRA held uh, not tax deductible and paid out of IRA. No, the property management fee would have to be paid from the IRA. And no, you don't deduct it on your taxes. Again, it's just an expense paid by your IRA. You don't get to deduct expenses that for a, an asset owned inside your IRA. When you hold a mutual fund inside your IRA and they're taking 1%, you don't get to deduct that from your taxes. It just lowers your return, your invest, like they take it directly from your retirement account. You, it's an expense but for, the, for the asset held inside the retirement account. You don't have to get, turn around and, and claim that on your personal income taxes. Okay? All right, that's it. No more questions. Um, again, uh, go read the SEC bulletin. Be aware that um, next month, i um, very excited. We're going to bring in a guest speaker, and we're going to be doing a webinar uh, talking about how to legally invest in the cannabis industry, a very growing uh, industry as more and more states legalize it. Uh, there is a tremendous number of investment opportunities, so we're going to be bringing somebody in that's going to talk about how to invest. Um, okay, i got two more questions. I'll go ahead and answer them if you guys want to stick around. Uh, I plan to invest as small ownership in a big LLC in a development project. How to handle the funds when the property is sold, say in three or five years? How to roll over the capital and earnings to the next asset if there's one identified, if there's none identified yet at the time of sale? The L your IRA is going to own a percentage ownership of the LLC. Once the LLC sells that, if they have cash in it, the LLC, it's up to the LLC to decide if they want to pay the investors back or if they want to keep the cash and make a new investment. If the LLC is going to pay the investors back, then your IRA is going to receive that cash back based on the percentage ownership that your IRA has in the LLC. If the LLC wants to keep the money and find another investment, then your, LL, your IRA just continues to hold its percentage share in that LLC. So it's up to you and the LLC how you want to handle that transaction. Uh, last question, I swear this is the last one I'm going to answer. If you invest in a private placement memorandum or private placement and it leverages finance, how should you be, how should you be accountable to UBIT tax? So the, uh, the, the company, the private placement, should um, provide you the information that you need to complete the Form 990-T, which is where you, where you submit UBIT. And then you send that 990-T to Entrust, and then we sign it and we cut a check uh, for whatever you're required to pay. So it's up to you as the account holder to, to work with your private placement to determine if you're subject to UBIT and then it's up to you to work with your accountant to do the 990T and then send that to us. Okay? And he adds, by the way, your investment is through your single member LLC. Um, if your LLC is borrowing money, then, I mean, a single member LLC is not going to be uh, subject to UBIT 
but it might be subject to UDFI if it uses borrowed money. So um, it, ultimately, my answer to that question is talk to your accountant. If you think you might be subject to UBIT or UDFI, work with your accountant to figure it out, and then submit the 990T to us, and then we'll, we'll, we'll send it to the IRS along with whatever UBIT your re retirement account needs to pay. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Join us next, uh, next month for our uh, cannabis investing webinar. Have a, good, uh, have a good rest of your week.